Good evening, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> We're here for the Cupertino Economic Development Workshop. Before we begin, I just want to introduce myself very quickly. My name is Noe Noyola. I'll be the facilitator for this discussion. Um, we have quite a, a few exercises here, presentation. But before that, I wanted to introduce and bring up your city manager, David Brandt, for a few words. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what, what this um, effort is all about and why we're doing and, and, and what, we're, what kinds of things are we seeking to get out of the audience. Um, first of all, the number one question is, is this about development? The answer is no. This isn't, this isn't about development. Um, what we're here to do here is talk to both our business community and also our residents about what kind of businesses we want to attract to Cupertino, what kind of businesses do we want to keep in Cupertino, what kinds of things do businesses need in terms of assistance from us, and what kinds of things do, do, can we do better that will help businesses succeed here. Um, and there's a lot of things uh, in, in that world to talk about. Um, uh, uh, not just, oh, how many square feet are going to be built, but really, what do we, what do, we do with the square feet that we have, uh, and what kind of policies can we um, implement that will make the business environment here more healthy? So uh, the number one person we have that actually implements all that stuff is Angela Sway, who will give a couple of words right after. But uh, again, this, this is to inform basically that program so that we can serve the business community better and also attract the kind of businesses that our residents want to see in, in this community. So Angela? Thank you, David, and thank you everyone for being here tonight to be a part of this conversation about our Cupertino business community. Uh, it's really important, um, as David said, to have this plan and this project uh, underway because it helps me to help the community and uh, Cupertino plan ahead and stay competitive in the future for our business needs uh, to grow our current local businesses as well as to attract ones uh, that we need in to diversify our business community. Uh, so it is very important that, that you're here today and participating. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview of what we will be discussing this evening is uh, the consultant teams that we have here tonight from Strategic Economics and MIG will be sharing a, a current, it is the existing conditions report. So to give you an idea of what we currently have here in Cupertino and our biz in terms of our business segments. And then also uh, we have invited a broker here to discuss Retailing 101 and to give you an idea as to uh, why retailers choose where they locate and um, kind of the thought process that goes into that as well. I do want to recognize two people here. Everyone's important, um, but I do want to highlight that council member Gilbert Wong is here. And then Monica Tong from uh, Assemblymember Evan Lowe's office is here too. So again, thank you this, um, for being here. And I am going to pass it on to Sujata, who is one of our consultants with Strategic Economics. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I want to just pr provide a little bit of an overview of some of the business data that we've been analyzing to just provide a little bit of context. Um, so today, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction of what our project is, um, some of these trends, um, a conversation about the city's fiscal health, and then um, we'll talk a little bit about retail with um, some additional information that Christine Furstenberg from JLL will be providing us as a broker. And then we'll move into table discussions because our objective is actually to hear from you all today rather than have us uh, talk at you all night. So uh, to begin with, what, what we're really working on here is what's called an economic development strategic plan. This is a guiding document that really focuses on businesses in the city. Uh, it's meant to help think through the strategies that the city can employ with partners on recruiting and expanding and, um, 
and retaining existing businesses as well. It also considers things like the city's fiscal health. So by that I mean you know, the budget that's available to provide the necessary services to residents. Um, and really our focus today is not really necessarily about new development, it's really about maximizing what's already on the ground here in Cupertino and thinking about some of the implementation strategies uh, that we can continue moving forward or you know, if there are other additional ideas, we'd like to have that be part of this document as well. So where we are right now, this is the first time we're really talking to the community. We're really at the beginning stages of the project. Uh, we're going to be releasing what Angela referred to as the economic background report, which is going to provide a little bit of data and analysis. Um, then we'll be releasing a draft strategic plan, and then um, after getting more input, we'll be uh, creating a final strategic plan. This is probably going to take a few months to complete. So I just want to give you a little bit of a highlight, like I said before, on what, we, what, we're, what kinds of economic data we're really looking at. Um, to begin with, we look at jobs in the region and in Cupertino. It's important to contextual, contextualize everything that's happening in the city um, with broader economic trends. So uh, this graph is just a, a kind of stating what we probably already know in this room, which is that employment has been growing in the South Bay. Unemployment rates have been dipping. There's been a nice, strong recovery from the recession. And in Cupertino specifically, you're seeing rapid growth um, in jobs. This graph only takes you to 2013 because that's the data that we have available. But we know that if we incorporated 2014 and 2015, we'd continue seeing an upward trend in the total number of jobs in the city. And we know that that growth has been um, consistent. When we uh, do an economic strategy, it's also important to understand what kinds of businesses are in the community and understanding the industries um, that are present, where there are strengths and where there may not be uh, as much of a presence. So um, we looked at dif these different industry categories and compared Cupertino to the region again, uh, defined as the South Bay. Um, and what is probably um, evident to many of you is that there's a strong basis in knowledge-based industries. And by that, we're referring to things in the technology sectors, but also things in legal, accounting, engineering, um, um, management, kind of a wide swath of, you know, what we used to call white collar professions. Um, there's a less of a less of a, a concentration of manufacturing and industrial uses in Cupertino relative to some of the neighboring cities um, and the counties. Um, so if you look at these charts, you can kind of see that uh, that very pronounced concentration in these knowledge based sectors with less of a strength than others. Uh, when you look at the very large employers, that same sort of pattern can play out. I think it's also important to notice you have a strong uh, institutional uh, base of employers as well, with education being a big, big part of the local economic base. <clears throat> we know that there's been a lot of emphasis on some of the really large employers in Cupertino, but we wanted to really focus on not just the big, giant employers, but some of the smaller, sometimes not as well understood employers here in the city. So we wanted to take a look at the ones that have 250 or less employees and understand what kinds of, what kinds of companies those are. Um, and what we found was that um, about 62% of the companies in the city have four or fewer employees. So you have a very strong base of very small businesses. Um, and this is a, 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 a higher percentage than you can find in the region as a whole. The city's employment is uh, concentrated along very, um, the major corridors, Stevens Creek Boulevard, North De Anza, and, and Bub Road, with kind of different types of employment mixes throughout these different locations. <clears throat> Um, fiscal health is a, also another topic that we wanted to kind of provide a little bit of a, an overview on. And when we talk about fiscal health, we're really just trying to understand the relationship between the revenues uh, that the city has at its disposal to provide essential services um, and the cost of providing those services. Um, one thing that was interesting to find is that, like many other places, the general fund goes up and down depending on economic cycles. 
growth in uh, the jobs and population and, and other types of investments has created a, an increase in the property tax and sales tax revenue, um, hotel tax revenue in the city. And um, Apple accounts for about 18% of general fund revenues according to 2012 to 2013 data. So um, when you look at this pie chart, you see you have actually a, a wide diversity of revenue sources. Some cities depend highly on property taxes. Some cities uh, are more dependent on sales tax. You actually have a nice mix of revenue sources, um, but it is uh, a significant factor that one large employer accounts for, for much of the city's revenue base. On uh, the expense side, which is what's the cost of providing those uh, important services that are so important to quality of life in the city. Um, there's also a nice diversity. I, I've worked in other cities where public safety is the majority of the general fund expenditures because there's not a lot of revenue available to be able to provide things like parks and, and community services. That's not so much the case here. Um, and the staffing levels have generally stayed fairly consistent um, over time, which is also uh, puts the city in a, in a strong fiscal position. A big uh, source of revenue for the city is uh, the hotel tax and some of the uh, higher room rates and occupancy rates that you've seen, been seeing have been directly related to um, job growth because they are business serving hotels for the most part. Um, so the room occupancies going up, the, rev the rates going up generates an important source of revenue for the city. So um, I'm gonna transition now to the retail sector and turn it over to Christine so she can explain a little bit about the logic of how retailers look at different types of investment decisions. And then um, I'll come back and sort of wrap up and then we'll hear back uh, from you guys in the smaller groups. Thank you so much. I'm going to move this up a little bit. Uh, my name is Christine Furstenberg. I'm with JLL Retail in San Francisco. And I'm just going to hit this. I'm going to start out with a slide, um, kind of a general overview about the Bay Area. Um, I think all of you probably know things are very expensive here. <laughs> and it's the same with retail and retail rents. Right now, we're going through a period where rents have gone up so substantially in the Bay Area just in the last year. For example, the chart that you can see on the right shows the rental rate growth in Walnut Creek, 25% between 2014 and 2015. Now, the chart shows Palo Alto has an increase of only 10% in one year but that was because the Palo Alto rents were already so high. Um, but Redwood City is a reflection of most of the peninsula and you'll see a 22% increase in rents. So just think if your income went up 22% in one year, what a great thing. So the rents that are going up this fast ref will reflect in the things that you buy at the retailers because they need to pass on these rents. The next slide will show a little bit about um, the product and the net absorption of what that product is. What I was so surprised about um, is in the Bay Area last year, we had a net absorption, which means that there was 1.8 million square feet of retail space that was newly built and occupied in 2014. In 2015, we have 115,000 square feet. That's new construction of retail space in a retail shopping center that is newly built and occupied. That's a pretty shocking number. Now, that is only through July of this year, but it is a pretty staggering number. And according to the statistics and the uh, economists, they have identified um, and they've plotted our cities basically where they might fall in the progression with Santa Clara County on and San Mateo County in the peaking area, meaning that they are economies, retail economies that are peaking, 
and at some time in the near future, we'll probably hit a, soft, a softening. In fact, our economists are telling us that the softening will happen in about 2017. The next screen I want to go to is about construction. And I know that many of you will think, wait a minute, there's so much construction going on. What's she talking about that uh, you know, construction is so minimal? But retail construction is retail shopping center construction. And that's different than the retail that you might see at the bottom of a mixed use building. There is a lot of construction going on of residential with retail at the bottom. But that is not reflected in our numbers. Our numbers basically look at the retail that is being built, retail shopping centers. But when we have such a low vacancy rate, the rents go up. The Bay Area has the lowest vacancy rate in the country right now, in the country. And this graph here on the right will show that a little bit better. In San Francisco being uh, the total amount of inventory, it's so small you can hardly see it on the graph, but we have the smallest amount of inventory in the country available for retail space. So again, um, it's a very tight market and uh, it's hard for retailers to um, find sites. And that brings me into talking a little bit generally about um, how a retailer looks for a site. It's really, um, it's a different and interesting process. It's kept me in this business for almost 30 years because I find it fascinating. But um, many of you might think, well, why is this important to me? I mean, does it really matter? And it does in the sense that if you've ever asked yourself, why can't my city have a Nordstrom? Why can't my city have XYZ tenant? And the answer is, it's about how they identify what trade areas work for them and how they do the site selection process. So I thought it would be interesting and a little educational to kind of walk you through that process very quickly. And then if you do have questions about it later, I can answer the questions when we have our breakout sessions. So the first slide talks about who does the retail site selection. And normally, it's a uh, employee of a retailer, a real estate manager. And they're the people that um, work across the whole country. I have some real estate managers that cover the entire United States. And then they hire brokers like us to go ahead and work the specific markets for them. The items that impact site analysis, the trade area and site demographics are very big. Uh, location within the trade area, the design of the center and the construction costs, which I'll talk about a little bit later, site plan layout and co-tenancy, rent costs, deal structure, and competitors in the area. If all of these factors are met uh, in a shopping center, all of these factors meet the tenant's criteria, then the tenant will maximize their sales from that um, particular site. And that's important for tenants. What we start with is the trade area identification. And what that means is that each tenant has a specific trade area that they, that they identify as where they pull customers from. For example, a Nordstrom. That might be a trade area of 20 miles. A grocery store is much smaller. Their trade area might only be one and a half to two miles. But every type of tenant will have its own trade area identification. And what we need to do is match the demographics that they would like to see and outline the trade area for them. So we do this by mapping that you can see as an example on that particular slide. Here's another example. And I brought this in because this is what I used when I actually did a site analysis and a site location for a tenant that located here in Cupertino. So we had to look at, um, you can see from this slide that we took the average household income and we color blocked it so it's easy for the real estate managers to look at. Um, and you can see that you know we identify what each of those colors mean. You can see that in Cupertino, the um, average household incomes are quite high. The next slide talks about population density. And again, what we do with our mapping is we overlay um, 
a lot of information on one map so they can see the density, they can see their competitors close by, and they can see a site where they've um, potentially identified a, a, a possible site. One of the next items is the trade area demographics, and demographics are a little bit different than just identification of a trade area. They will look specifically at what does that specific trade area look like demographically? What's it made up of, of um, the ethnicity, uh, the amount of population per acre, the education of that population, and the age of that population. So those are very important items to tenants. And it's surprising, most people wouldn't think that, well, why do they care what age I am? But these retailers really identify who their customers are. They know who their prime customer is, how old you are, how young you are, how young your purchases are, um, in a sense, you know, what kind of purchases you make. One of the next items is the design um, of a shopping center. It's very important to create the image that the retailer wants to convey to the shopper. I want to show you a slide. You might recognize it. It was of the Homestead Square Shopping Center when I first started looking for my tenant. And um, I, I saw the, the space. And had I not known that that center was going to be redeveloped, I wouldn't have considered it for my tenant at all because my tenant really requires that a center look upscale because they believe that that's the, um, they want to convey that concept to their customers. That's the center right before my tenant opened. You can see that it's been renovated and rebuilt very nicely. These are the plans that um, were approved at the city before the shopping center got built. It's Homestead Square, and my tenant is uh, the new Steinmart there. Um, one of the other things that's important to the tenants when they look is the co-tenancy. So when I looked at uh, Homestead Square, what was very important was, OK, Christine, who else is going to be in the center? Who else will those customers be shopping for when they come to that center? because every retailer wants to take advantage of the other retailers, their co-tenants, shoppers. So if a shopper's coming to uh, Safeway, Steinmark believes that that shopper may go to their store also. So co-tenancy is very important to tenants. Of course, rent and triple nets. And as you know, um, the rents are very, very expensive. And while it's, you know, Steinmart has not, does, this is the first Bay Area store that they have, so they're not used to paying the kind of rents that they got charged here in Cupertino. It happens to be um, the number two highest rent that they paid in the United States. So you, uh, you hold a record in, for the city of Cupertino for Steinmart. Another item that's important is a comp uh, competition map. The tenants need to know where their competitors are, where the traffic patterns are, how people drive to the different shopping areas. So again, they need to look at how, where the competitors are. If you've noticed in all of this, I haven't once looked at and shown you um, a outline of the city of Cupertino's boundaries. That's because tenants don't look at that. And every single one of us that live in a city, we think about our city as this is my city, this is where I live, this is where my kids have grown up, this is what I am passionate about. But the retailers don't look at it like that. They look at a trade area. And so there's a disconnect sometimes when you're talking about, wow, I want this tenant Nordstrom to come to my city. They don't, again, they don't look at it with city boundaries. They look at trade areas. So when um, next time, when you think about asking for a, a tenant to come, you might call me, call Angela, and we can talk about trade areas for you and explain you know, how, what's the area that a particular tenant would look for um, to locate in. And that is what I have right here. 
Thank you all very much. So um, that was really interesting information. I, we have done a little bit of analysis of retail uh, trends in Cupertino, and um, Christine kind of highlighted some of these. But this is actually uh, a graphic that her group put together. But it kind of highlights what she was talking about in terms of uh, where sales are concentrated. So this is a heat map that shows the location of retail sales um, and the hotter the color, so the red, uh, the, the bright red is, you know, concentration of sales, um, where the sales num volumes are higher. Um, and you can kind of pick out where the major shopping centers are in the region and where Cupertino kind of lies within that competitive environment. Um, I think that that's an important piece of, of kind of just to follow up on what Christine was stating that these trade areas are set up. There's some some distances and some. Uh, if you did some analysis on kind of how this how the space spatial logic works out, there are some places that really pop on this map. Um, one thing that we've heard uh, has been raised in the past uh, for many cities has been, you know, well, how come we are we are getting a lot of this particular type of retail? We don't get a lot of the other type of retail. This kind of graphic just shows you where you are right now, not necessarily where you could go in the future. Uh, but where it sh what it shows is that, uh, according to the most recent data that we had available, which is 2013, um, you know, there, was, there was less of the general merchandise stores, like the, you know, the, the, the bigger, bigger department stores, and more of restaurants and other types of retail, um, smaller types of formats, rather than the larger retailers in the city, less of the clothing, but a lot of strength in restaurants and in, in uh, grocery and food stores. The sales have also fallen um, in Cupertino since 2005. A lot of this has been the, the gradual, um, uh, the gradual uh, pulling back of some of those larger stores that were at Valco. Um, it, there's also an interesting uh, factor here in thinking about what uh, Christine was laying out in terms of retail center uh, design and some of the preferences in terms of location. Uh, it's important to note that some of the retail stock in the city is considerably older than some of the other communities surrounding Cupertino. Um, if you look at the year that some of the centers were built, a lot of them are are, are aging. You know, they were built from they were built before 1960 or in the in the during the 1960s. Um, so some of that reinvestment and kind of upgrading of existing centers can be one strategy to kind of bring in a different type of, of tenant and different kind of retail mix into a city. She uh, spoke about Homestead, Homestead Square and asked us if we could provide any data on really what has happened in the before and after. So before, um, when it was anchored by, I, I believe it was Rite Aid and Michaels, um, the, the retail sales were uh, doing fine, but uh, with the reinvestment and the retenanting, um, you can kind of see this big uptick in the uh, sales tax revenues that were, uh, the sales and the sales tax revenues that were achieved at that center. Um, so certainly there's an economic, uh, there's some economic effects to, to that strategy that the city can benefit from. So I know we've given you a lot of information. I think the next step today is to gather some input from you all. Um, as I said before, the input that we get from you will go into our report and uh, generate a lot of the ideas and policies and, and actions items that will go into the Economic Development Strategic Plan. I'm going to turn it over to Noe, who's going to give you some guidance on how we're going to move ahead on the table discussions. All right, everybody. Now we get to the work part of the workshop. Uh, let's see. We have in store for you, in front of you, we have some poster boards that we would like. Some we would like to use these as uh, formats, platforms through which we can gather some input from the community. We've heard from sort of experts on data. And now we want to hear from locals about local knowledge. Um, it's important, it's crucial to gather this information from, from folks that know the community from a different perspective. And so um, what I'm going to do is invite some of the facilitators, some city staff are going to help uh, guide some of these discussions. We'll have these small, intimate group discussions. Um, we'll be able to pull out the, the posters. But 
what I'd like to do is to, to have uh, maybe consolidate some tables if uh, folks don't mind. Um, how about, uh, okay, there you go. Uh, you can go to number six. Uh, folks in number five, would you mind coming over to number four, please? And, okay, uh, let's see. Okay, so you have, you have some posters in front of you. Now, <clears throat> there are five questions that we're gonna go ahead and answer. One is, what are the top strengths and assets in Cupertino? Two, what are the major challenges for retaining and recruiting businesses in Cupertino? Three, what types of businesses should the city recruit and expand? Four, how, how to better support, how do we better support businesses by the city and community? What, what, what can be done? And five, particular locations. Now, I suppose I could go over some ground rules here, but I think it's pretty self-evident. Be respectful, don't talk over each other, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, at the end, we'll come back and you have about 45 minutes to just go over this and uh, go ahead, jump right in. By the way, if anybody has any questions before we get into it, if anybody has any questions that you'd like to go ahead and, uh, and present or record, use the comment cards and the index cards provided for you at your tables. Thank you. Okay, some fascinating discussions happening today. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for sticking through this and you know, following the process. It's, uh, it's beyond helpful to hear what people are thinking that have this local experience, this local knowledge, and just be able to express this and hopefully capture this to then turn it into some policy, hopefully. We're just at the start of the process here, but what we're gonna do now is go through each one of the groups. Have, uh, has everyone selected speakers? Okay, so let's start with this group, which um, come on up right here. Go ahead and bring, bring, your, uh, bring your posters, please. And actually, let's have another, Jake, do you mind helping him, uh, helping John hold uh, the poster, please? And Claudio, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the penmanship, please. Okay, let's go ahead. Hey, guys, go ahead and step up on the, on the, on the uh, yeah, on the platform. So, Claudio, go ahead and tell us a little bit about, and you don't have to tell us everything. Okay. You, we just... Hey we'll folks, hey folks, I want to uh, draw everybody's attention over here, please. So just tell us the highlights. Give us, give us a sense, we're on SportsCenter, just give us the highlights of the discussion. What were the, con what were the conflicts? What were the key takeaways? What are some of the sort of messages that you want to make sure that get on the record, particularly to the city staff? All right, so as you all know, our top strength is our is Apple and of course being a uh, tech savvy city. Mm -hmm. um, access to education obviously is the best in the world. Uh, no access for those who work here. Mm -hmm. uh, location, obviously we're centrally located. It's a fairly easy access. Mm -hmm. Employees, lots of employees are uh, local businesses and are here between 9 to 5. Uh, infrastructures, uh, highways 85 and 280. Mm -hmm. These are the highlights for us, but. Well, let me ask you one thing, since we don't have a lot of groups, I'm gonna go ahead and take the liberty and ask some questions. So with, with easy access, when you talk about easy access, what, what specifically are you talking about? Traffic. Traffic. Roads. There's roads here, okay. So not necessarily transportation, just cars. You can get here easily with cars. Correct, Okay. yes. Now, uh, question number two, what do you think of the major challenges for retaining and recruiting businesses? Uh, where the highlights were supply and demand. These were our, high, our highlights. And for recruiting new businesses, increase the supply. Okay, so, where, so challenges are supply and demand that there's not enough supply. Correct. And too much demand. Cupertino is growing. Unfortunately, everybody thinks otherwise, but the reality is different. Okay, and what kind of demand did people talk about? Uh, 
Sorry to put you on the spot. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to get some details. I think it's, uh, we're talking about major growth, so major infrastructure that we don't have. Okay. That would be one of it. Okay, okay, sorry, go ahead. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Lily. No, don't worry. Uh, uh, stretch it out a little bit, Jake, please, so the camera can see. You asked me to go through the highlights. Yeah, so. I did, I did. <laughs> now I'm saying, oh, go to the details. Oh, <laughs> all right. Um, the needs for recruiting new business is to provide space. Okay. Uh, which is vital. Uh, follow the market trends and allow uses. Yeah, market share for allowed uses is Change policies to follow. Correct. Okay, follow market trends to create space for what is needed for the, the needs of new businesses. Right. Okay. And uh, for the city to encourage the, uh, the youth. Uh, to participate in community outreach and provide their um, feedback and, and uh, uh, initiative and hopes and for the city because it's theirs in 20 years. Or how, does, how, does that, yeah, how does that relate to economic development in the city? It's their city. They live here. Okay. So they may want to work here as well and right. see and give their uh, vote. Right. <laughs> their stamp of confidence. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and drop it to the ground. That's, oh, right. <clears throat> Types of business the city should focus on. Uh, service for youth and seniors, citizen. Like, like what? What's a service for youth and seniors? Uh, areas where they can hang out um, after work or after school mm -hmm. or an area where they can feel safe or where they feel like they can hang out and spend money but yet have all the entertainment they were asking for. And we don't provide. There's not a area per se where they can feel either safe or a place where for community. Okay, so we're not talking about services. We're not talking about like government services, communities. We're talking about businesses that cater to youth right. and, okay. And, and a five-star hotel, as you all know, Apple is here. So therefore a five-star hotel, when we say five-star is not for spending it, but mostly to recognize and have a convention center. Because if I want to get married and I want to have 300 uh, people here, I can do it in Cupertino, so That's it would help wedding. for bar mitzvahs, for birthdays, for any social events sure. that would be helpful for the community of Cupertino. Okay. Um, Hotel tax. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct to generate more for the city mm -hmm. on top of it. High-end restaurants, but again, a five-star hotel would provide a, a nice sports bar where it would reach also the... Uh, either the senior community and or the youth community or place to hang out as well. Okay. Now for the other question, I uh, can't see. What, what can the city and community partners do to better support businesses in Cupertino? Smart growth, uh, accept change and, and what? <laughs> and what? Yeah, Who's he wrote, who wrote this stuff? <laughs> No, and uh, proposed for it. Claudia, when you talk about smart growth, what, do you, what, what does that mean? Help us understand what, you, what your group meant by smart growth. Um, well, now I'm... Yeah, anybody want to help from your group? Yeah, because I'm going to put my own thoughts into it. And that's fine. <laughs> you're, the one that's you're the one with a microphone. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to add um, smart growth. What I think our group means is grow according to the needs of residents okay. and people who work here. So residents, we're talking about families with kids, so services that uh, service youth, okay, service seniors, or, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a high school board member, so I always think of my teenagers. Sure. Our parents would love to be able to drop their kids in a place where the kids can have a piano lesson or a violin lesson and have something to eat and then go shop a little bit and then have another SAT lesson. I don't know, somewhere the parents can just drop in and feel safe and teenagers would like to hang out. They can hang out in our wonderful library, but that's only one place. Right? Does, so we really need places for does, teenagers. Does, does, does the city not have that currently? Not at all. I mean, where do you go when... Um, when the teenager hand up library, right? Or, yeah, so parks. That's not a good place for them to hang out. The teenagers okay. go to parks, always not good. Okay. okay. And okay. Um, so for our employees work here, I think there are two points I would like to make. The employees are really busy. If they can have, if our local groceries would have an online service and they can order food and put their in their lobby, they they drive home with their groceries, that's a great service and it adds to our supermarkets or our places. Even drive-by drive dining services, people who don't have time to work, they order 
pick up, go home, mm -hmm. and that's a great service. So that's what we're talking about. Small growth that meets the residents and people who work here's needs. Understood. That, I think that's what we talk about, smart growth. Okay, thanks for pinch hitting there. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I think you weren't done, right? Oh, you were done. All right, well, thanks for finishing up then, cleaning up. Okay, thank you, and this will be, uh, we'll label this one group one then, okay? Right, thank and you. we just want to touch base oh, on the see, particular we locations we though, that we want to revitalize, <laughs> and the upgrades is Valco, the Oaks, and the Cupertino in area. Okay, to upgrade. That's any, any ideas about upgrading, particularly? <sighs> Not yet. Okay, fair enough. Thank you very much. Next group. Do you have a sport? Uh, let's go right here, guys. If you guys can go up here, and who's gonna be the spokesperson? Great. What's your name? Art. 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 Yeah. Try to stretch so, it out, please. Okay. So, um, so for. So we have some quite similar to Group One with respect to you know technology. We have a we have Apple as a large technology company. Cupertino is, is is pretty well known for the largest tech company in the world. Mm -hmm. um, we have for access to education, it's the same thing. We have the, a great public school system. And uh, for uh, location, we're centrally located in Silicon Valley. So in our Infrastructure is, you know, we have great accessibility to all these highways. Even if they're crowded, they're, they're there. So we're right in the center of it all. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, for other, um, we have really um, uh, intelligent, uh, you know, uh, uh, residents uh, who are very active, very active community base. Mm -hmm. So they're they're interested in their community. They just, you know, they they participate. They give feedback. Mm -hmm. Um, getting into challenges for retaining and rec recruiting businesses is cost of living, rent, mortgages. Um, rent is probably the key to keeping diversified businesses is, you know, uh, proximity to neighbors and cities impacting Cupertino. All of these things are, are, are challenges, if you will, for, for retaining, you know, and recruiting businesses. Or did your group talk, any <clears throat> anecdotes, did they talk about any people that they knew, businesses that were priced out or that wanted to uh, move here and just left or, or couldn't? Was there any, any, dis any further discussion on the high rents? Um, any specifics on that? I'm not sure That's if okay. we, I don't think we had any an a particular anecdotes okay. of, of a it's particular just, business, it's, it's, but there were some businesses that you talked about, Eric, I think that tried to come and were not able to come for different reasons. So, so it's just, it's, I mean, it's clear. It's just it's a well understood thing that it's very expensive to settle yeah. here as a business. Yeah. Okay. And uh, with regards to recruiting new businesses, we discussed the, the need for office space. Mm -hmm. There's really, you know, a dearth of office space available for small businesses. Okay. So, because right now, as soon as something gets opened up, our large business, our, you know, Apple, you know, takes it very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so then there's not a whole lot for, let's say, if a small startup company wants, you know, 1,000 square feet, 1,500 square feet, maybe even 5,000 square feet, it's just not available. And this is to distinguish from what I think the previous group was saying, that you're, you're specifically saying office space. You're not right. saying retail uh, or just general small uh, space. Well, there, there's also a lack of retail, is la lack of retail space available, too. Okay. Okay. I mean, that there's definitely a dearth of that as well. Okay. Okay, um, and of course, you know, affordable rent for certain types of businesses is also a is also a challenge. Okay, so so figuring out some <clears throat> way to uh, help new businesses that want to settle here compete with Apple, basically. Is well, for, for for office space for office, space. For, for office space businesses, yes. Okay, and then for for retail, there's 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 a whole lot of challenges all as right. well. Certain types of retail businesses. Uh, all right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you can just drop it on the ground, guys. Thanks. So we talked a little bit about what type of businesses should the city focus on recruiting or expanding. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about home goods, pottery, arts, crafts type businesses, uh, maintaining uh, ice skating rink type businesses. Uh, uh, wait, wait, what, is, what would that be? Like an ice skating rink type of business? Well, it's an, it's an ice skating rink. Oh, okay. Okay, we have an ice skating rink here in Cupertino. I just thought you said an ice, a type of business. Well, like, well be... basically the type, is, 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 the type of businesses is businesses that are community oriented, that are gathering, that gather, people gather around. I grew up in Southern California, folks. I don't know what an ice rink is. Oh, they got ice skating down there somewhere. <laughs> 
Fair, yeah, roller, roller rink, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but you're saying like entertainment type of businesses. Get, well, it's, it's entertainment businesses or businesses that are, that are getting community together. That sure. They, they get, you know, creating sure. interactivities, sure. whether, it's a, whether it's a movie theater or it's late night establishments or sure. it's, uh, you know, public spaces. Sure. You know, if you look at what Main Street is, Main Street has, has a, you know, we have a park there and we have like a center section there where people can gather and they can have music going on and things like that. Okay. Those kind of things are, are, are important. And, uh, and also, you know, businesses that cater to kids and adults, sure. that's, that's important too. Sure, all related to social cohesion. It's all related to this social and to, and to gathering mm -hmm. so that there's businesses that, you know, bring, bring people together. So that people um, aren't, aren't bowling alone as uh, right. the famous book said. So then we got into what can the city do to, to, to support some of these community businesses from coming, to coming here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we came up with the city should support, you know, uh, projects that, that provide a benefit to the community or otherwise known as these kind of community benefits without being very well defined. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the challenge out there for developers is that the developer wants, uh, you know, need, needs, to make a, needs to make a profit in building something. So right. let's give an example that's very close and near and dear to my heart, okay? So let's say you want a community movie theater and you want to build a new community movie theater. Well, that's, that's great, but to the developer, um, the community movie theater can't pay the $4 or $5 per square foot rent. And by the way, this is, this is true whether you're in San Jose or in Cupertino sure. or Campbell or Mountain View. So, that, so it's very difficult for the developer to justify you know, the, 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 uh, the building of, of that type of uh, tenant mm -hmm. in, 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 his, in his community when he's about to develop. Right. So um, we right now have a, a concept called BMR for housing. We need a concept for we need a B, which is below market rate. Below market we need rate. we need a B, we need BMR for for um, for for our retail type of businesses, businesses that we want in our community. So if we want that ice skating rink in our community, we need we, we need to have a BMR. Now for the developer to do a BMR, they need to get some kind of credit for that, mm -hmm. just like we give them credit for the housing BMRs. Mm -hmm. So if the going rate is four dollars and we only charge a dollar for let's say the rental space. Uh, that's a three dollar difference. Mm -hmm. Then you know you add that up, and we give a credit for the number of years and so forth and so on that the that the uh, that the landlord is giving. Sure. See, so w what that does is to the community is that so so now the developer says, well, look, I want you know I want a hundred you know I want higher heighted buildings. I want more office space. I want you know uh, you know uh, you know uh, mm -hmm. uh, more housing, whatever it may be, and. But for that, I'm going to ensure that we're going to have the kind of businesses that we really want to bring to our community. Sure. So he gets a, you know, the developer gets a credit for that, but, he, but he, at the end of the day, he probably does even better right. than he would have had he, you know. And also, it, it becomes easier for the community to, community to get support right. for that. So, so you're, you're advocating some, some type of mechanism mm -hmm. that helps the developer go ahead and create create these these types of businesses or or create space for these types of businesses that wouldn't necessarily otherwise be created. Yeah, and, and I bring up ice skating rink and I bring up these uh, uh, bowling alley and, and and so forth because and, and and community theater. I mean, these are all these are all real life situations. These are businesses. Some of them are at the Valco. Some are at the Oaks. And, and they're all going to be redeveloped at some point, and there's going to be higher density, and there's, right. going to be, there's going to be different types of retail moving in, and so forth and so on. Right. Um, that said, we, we, we want to, there are certain types of businesses that we as a community need to decide that we want. And if we want those things, mm -hmm. but we want the developer to give it to us, then we have to give something back to the developer too. So it has to be, it has to be a fair, fair, yeah. And, and so and then I think it's going to be an easier, um, it's going to be easier for our uh, community to accept that because they're going to say, well, okay, I'm not losing my bowling which I love where I could drop my kids off or some, you know, some other, uh, you know, community kind of places, whatever they may be, that otherwise cannot afford. I, I'll, I'll give you an example that I think would do really well in, in Cupertino. Jumpy houses. My, you know, these, these, uh, they go to these jumpy houses, places. Well, there's no... I mean, or, or um, uh, a, uh, a baseball, you know, batting cage. Sure. Those places cannot afford the rent in Cupertino. Sure. If we decided as a community we thought that that was a good idea, right. we can have those things here 
and we just have to give the developer the incentive to, to do that. But, but there's an opportunity here because the developer, and I don't know if there's any developers in the room right now, you, you have an opportunity because you, know, you, you can now get the height that you need and all the other things that you need by bringing in a particular business. And this is why I think the definition of community benefits needs to be and continue to be vague. We don't, we don't need to define it. Okay. We just need to keep it very vague so there's opportunities because we as a city are gonna change constantly and there might be some other kind of business that comes in and say, wow, we really want that business in here. How do we get it? And this is a way to do it. Art, I don't want to cut you off, but uh, we have another group to go, and yeah, we're sure. running out of time. So just go ahead and finish up number oh, five. Oh, yeah. Please. Well, number five, um, there are, we, you know, we, we looked at uh, upgrades and re revitalization. So the obvious ones are the ones that the other group mentioned, but these are two other cent locations. Homestead Lanes, that, that center could be, could be not necessarily re revitalized or, or, you know, could use a facelift where the McDonald's got a facelift. Well, the rest of the center could use a facelift as well. Okay. And, uh, and the Lori Center. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure. What's the Lori Center? That's, that's off of De Anza. That's What's that? Oh, that's on Stevens Creek. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that strip mall there. That, that could use... That could use that could use a uh, an uplift as well, a re okay. you know, an upgrade of some sort. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And let's let's name that one number two, please. Okay. Uh, group three. Uh, there were a lot more people over there, so come on up, please. Oh, you guys had a lot to say earlier, so come on up. Please, Cliff Notes. All right. Let me see, because I did know. Let's see. Uh, this is what we do first. Okay. I think we're going to just kind of wrap it up a little bit because we, we've heard from um, other groups and they're pretty much the same as, as about talking about development and. Um, of course, the city and Apple and what have you. But I think we focus a little bit more on being longtime residents of Cupertino. Uh, my parents moved here in 67. We've lived here that long. My husband was born in 1952, so we've been here for many years, way before Cupertino was probably even on the map, way before Valco was here. So we kind of looked back at a little bit, a little bit different than some of the other groups did, as we talked about the heritage of Cupertino that's been lost, the buildings that were here, Cali Brothers, Mariani, Mariani, and some of the people that made Cupertino who what it is today. This is before Steve Jobs, because he's my age. So it was long before that time that Cupertino became Cupertino, and we lost all that heritage. So when you go downtown Campbell, for example, you see the older buildings, you kind of have the feel, the friendly feel of that city, because they kept that little bit, that feel of their heritage, the water tower, for example, Sunnyvale downtown, Murphy's Avenue, if you're familiar with that. Um, so. That's Murphy, Murphy Estate, long time people that pretty much own the city of Sunnyvale. So you have that feel of the community. We don't really have that in Cupertino because things have been torn down and rebuilt. So we thought, we as a group thought, in a way to bring in people is that as a, the neighbor, neighbors, not people that work here and come and go, but people that live here, that we, we lost that feeling of our hometown. So when the buildings come in or people come, that they kind of incorporate some type of a, a old school feeling like uh, buildings like let's say De Anza, you know, it's named after obviously from, um, you know, someone uh, I think was, well, anyway. So that kind of a uh, Spanish look was from, the, well, they built that in the 60s. So we lost all that, all these big buildings. We don't want all the, the big six or seven story buildings that we have because we're not San Jose. But keeping it to a smaller community, pulling in uh, residents and stores, with a feeling that you can shop close to home and you have a community. You kind of lost our community. During the discussion that I sat in on, you talked a little bit about character. Can you tell us a little about what you what Oh, you characters mean by in, the building, in buildings and what have you. Because if you do go to Campbell or you go to some of these other towns, you know, it draws the people. Because it has character. The buildings have a little bit of style. The inside, the interiors, people go and look at the, you know, that's really cool inside. It's not just like these four walls and glass buildings. So we thought we'd just pull in maybe some type of building buildings as they build, as, as they're going to build, and growth is inevitable, but something that's not just glass, and that's five or six story buildings, that has some, some type of character that, you know, um, that people will draw to and want to come to, because that's what we, most people enjoy, you know. Um, I think that's what we kind of focused a little bit more on that, and obviously we talked about expensive rent, and how can you get these small 
companies into like Main Street uh, because the rent's so going to be so high. Mm -hmm. How can what, do, what can they do to bring them in because they're having a hard time obviously renting to them the same as the other groups have said. Mm -hmm. So I think that. Uh, yeah, the old Valco is long, long gone from the first original Sears building. Was it even Valco? It was just Sears. Uh, and they had been remodeled so many times. So that actually needs so an you, update. So you were talking about the, the history, the, the historical heritage, the, the space. You talked about the, the cultural kind of feeling that you, that the group was, was trying to revive or mm -hmm. have again that in in future developments, this type of, you, you were wanting that kind of small town feel again that Cupertino used to have from the time that you that you, your group seemed to remember very right, well. Right, because the, the people that were with our group have been here for quite a while. Right. So they're not new, you know, new newcomers. And I understand there are newcomers, there are gonna be, sure. but we wanna keep our town. I mean, people don't even know what Valco stands for. So, you know, there's a reason why it's Valco. So we lost all that. Nobody knows anything sure. about Cupertino. Sure. In sure. a way. Now, uh, in the second page, uh, you also talked about uh, like what to what to service. Uh, I'm sorry. What kind of? You, sorry. You talked about what. Sorry. You can just drop it on the ground. That's fine. Oh. Uh, in here, you you were talking about one of the things that you you mentioned was that um, the, the, there was a gap in the type of services that in essence, you couldn't go to a florist or a, a, you know, go to a, a, get your eyeglasses or something, that these kinds of businesses just simply were not around here. Is that, am I paraphrasing this right? Yeah, I think so. Some of the people in the group thought that. Unfortunately, what happens is like now Safeway has florist and pharmacies and everything, so it's a one stop type of store so we're probably not going to be able to have all that but we talked about the diversity somewhat like uh, Santana Row has of course we don't want to Santana Row right. but where you could go to lunch and a movie or you could go to sure. the gym which is there and lunch so it's not you know you could do a couple things in a small area because I know that's what they draw because uh Mm -hmm. I belong to groups there. So, but a diversity, like maybe there's a shoe store, maybe there's a, you know, a coffee shop, there's a, a lunch place, there's a dinner place mm -hmm. where people have a variety, similar to that, because you're not going to drive over and have dinner, then drive home mm -hmm. in that little section. There's only a 30% restaurants, they said, in Main Street. So a, a diversity, maybe a little clothing store or a little something that's going to draw people in and in to shop mm -hmm. as well as have lunch or yep. dinner and then the wine bar or whatever maybe that the other areas are really flourishing like Campbell and, the, and Santana Row. That's now, what they have. Now Pam, you also, uh, your group also mentioned something that the previous group talked about which was uh, economic incentives low, for low income or ma pop pro, uh, uh, stores and, and restaurants. How, can you tell us a little bit about what what the group wanted to see from that. We were hoping something like the city or someone, because obviously Cupertino is very high in you know rent, and because it's a new building, especially Main Street's going to be the Oaks is going to be Valco's going to be the same what same way as they're good. They offer low income for residents or middle income. They have to have a certain amount, I believe, in these new buildings. Mm -hmm. Do they have something that's going to be an incentive to the stores? Because you know a little shoe store is not going to be able to pay you know thousands of dollars per square foot so like we want to go into that area but we're too small of a store mm -hmm. you know so we were thinking maybe the I don't know if the city has programs maybe the state has programs where uh, stores can go in these high interest air high rent areas and be able to make it with some type of subsidizing mm -hmm. or incentive or right. some incentive, you know, down the line or something, because okay. they're not going to be able to go in with okay. with the price. I'm sure. Okay. Were there any specific uh, areas that mm. you wanted to focus on that your group thought I needed don't... some, you know, some? Upgrade? We did talk about. I, I see that they talked a little bit about pharmacies and 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 the groceries stores and all, but it's hard to put those in a small area like these are because we are going to compete with Safeway. We're going to compete with Whole Foods. Okay. So you're really not going to find that. Maybe a fruit stand type thing, mm -hmm. like a little farmer's market, like uh, a lot of the places store uh, cities have. But um, 
but competing with the big stores. You're not sure. going to be able to pull sure. in a small, a little mom and pop market. Okay. Thank you very much. Anything else? Thank you. I think that's it. I mean, we, we just thought that that's the areas that draw people are like, you know, Sunnyvale, downtown Murphy, Campbell, uh, places like that, where people get drawn because they feel it's a safe place, it's friendly, they can go to dinner, they can hang out with friends, you know, they can go after work or something like that. So okay. that's what we're hoping for. Great. Thank you very Thank much, ma'am. And let's see, that one's scoop three then. Okay. Thank you everybody for coming, for sticking around. Really appreciate it. Um, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've done, gone through several workshops throughout my life and I feel like every time I still get, you know, sort of uplifted by the input, by the community engagement process. So I want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, be on the lookout for, for future meetings, future activities related to this, uh, to this process. Good night, everybody. Have a good, have a good uh, safe trip home.